So let's talk about luxury yeah. goods a little bit. We're standing in a part of Sotheby's that's sort of like, you know, jewelry, sneakers. I think those are my dunks, but <laughs> and uh, I, I have, I need those two because you have a few Birkins. I don't have them in those colors. So <laughs> to what extent have the auction houses become luxury goods companies, and is that a good perception, a sort of a neutral perception, a pejorative in some worlds? How do you balance that? I that sense. We're looking to offer our clients all of the things that they want to buy and that's not just art, right? They live with things that go beyond art. They buy wine, they buy cars, they buy handbags, they buy jewelry, they buy watches. So we're trying to be sort of an all-service, one-stop luxury destination for them. And I think that, you know, things like handbags are actually a bit, and, and watches, for example, have proved to be for us a bit of a gateway into the bigger Sotheby's because these are things that they wouldn't necessarily know to buy at Sotheby's. So they find them here. So Birkin is kind of weed. It's the gateway drug. Absolutely. The, the Birkin is the new gateway it. drug. And you can You go from, from the gateway drug and, sure. and then you wind up at Picasso. Yeah, you buy a $20,000 Birkin and then the next step is, you know, you start looking at like a good a watch and then from there you go to a Picasso print and then you go on to something bigger. But is that the algorithm that's contacting those people saying, hey, you know, if you like Birkins, you'll like, you know, Rothko. It, it is, but it's really mostly our specialists. So all of our specialists are basically trained to think bigger than just their particular category. Our relationship managers obviously have specialty areas in which they focus, but they also think about the broader Sotheby's ecosystem. So when they're talking to a client and they figure out that maybe it would actually make sense for them to talk to them about watches or handbags or you know prints or sculptures, they kind of are already thinking that when they see the first purchase that that client makes. Is that sort of in your realm as business development more than the way that traditional art or jewelry specialists have thought? Absolutely, it's, it's one of the main things that we do and in do business development. Made, I, you know, I think that there's a little bit of tension occasionally because there, especially amongst people who have been at Sotheby's for a long time, there is a reliance on tradition and on the idea of like, this is how I always have worked with clients and this is how I've always done this. And it's always been a very like trusting handshake kind of business, but that's changed and evolved yet again because of how expensive things have gotten. And I think that people have trended to be more competitive perhaps in the way that they work with auction houses than they were in the past where they may have just been a one auction house person. Um, and I think that looking at statistics and data and how clients transact is really important to be able to sort of predict future clients. So what's the upper end Sotheby's is doing what? Five billion, six billion a year or something. Can it be 50? <laughs> I, I mean, think we'd love that. I mean, all, I, I mean, how far can luxury extend? We're trying to push all of the traditional categories to new levels and luxury and, and, and handbags and sneakers and all of these kinds of things is obviously a new venture for us. So we're excited to grow the things that are new, but we're also excited to evolve the things that are traditional. So old masters, decorative arts, uh, Chinese works of art, these are all incredibly traditional sort of like categories that you think of when you think of 19th century collectors. How do we make them applicable and re resonate with a 21st century collector? And that's how we're thinking about growing our clients and growing our business. So in terms of business development, how much of that is data driven and how much of that is history, art specialist driven and, and are you highly involved in the data side of it? It's both, it really is. And it's something that we are really focusing more and more on. We're looking to grow our client pool in a much more sort of organic way than I think we ever have before. What does that mean, an organic way of growing clients? Really looking at what they're buying and trying to sort of bring the art to them. So we're doing that by bringing art to people in their locations where they were summering during COVID, for example, opening galleries in East Hampton and Palm Beach and Aspen. So bringing art to the people is one way of doing it. But another way of doing it is really thinking of of art as just sort of another way that our pe that our clients live with their assets and sort of presenting them with things in different contexts. So the way we've changed our, you know, classifications of our sales, it's not so strictly, you know, impressionist and modern, contemporary. It's it's more about sort of how people are living with things. So you're tracking how many Medigliani bidders bid on Richter? Absolutely. That kind of cross-pollination so is incredibly, absolutely. It's incredibly important. And we're seeing more and more of that. And you have every, you know, for every one of our sales, we've got approximately 40% new clientele. That's a huge number. And that's an incredible amount of people that are now suddenly introduced to Sotheby's who we need to learn about and basically expand their reach. Well, 10 years ago, I think the database of the major auction assets was somewhere around 100,000 people. Yep. 
Is it more like a million now? It's, it's definitely up there. It's growing, like I said, exponentially during COVID because we got a whole new slew of clients who had never thought to buy with us before. And I think that the online features that we were able to sort of master during the COVID period made it that we were much more democratic. We were able to reach a large number of people that never thought to buy. Do you, do you think auction houses should be selling works in 2022, made in 2022? Yeah, I think that's a, a challenging question. I don't think that auction houses necessarily need to replace the role of galleries in terms of the primary market, but I do think that auction houses fill a void of giving access to people that perhaps some of the galleries aren't providing. And so I think that there is there is there is a place for the gallery to sell work that's contemporary, wouldn't, very contemporary. Wouldn't Sotheby's like to be a primary market as well? I think that we really aren't interested in being a primary market, but I think we're very much interested in working alongside the primary market because it is together as part of this sort of art ecosystem that we are making sure that artists are seen, viewed, appreciated, and those artists grow. Because you're already, between you and the other auction houses, probably the biggest art galleries in the world by sales. Well, certainly private sales. I mean, we, we're selling consistently over a billion dollars in private sales every year, which makes us a pretty big player as far as private sales are concerned. But we're not just selling primary market works, we're primarily selling secondary market works. <laughs>